Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ambassadors, Resident Representative of JICA Maldives, Vice Chancellor, Deputy Vice Chancellors, Distinguished Speaker, my colleagues, students, and guests. Assalamu alaikum and a very warm welcome to everyone attending this session. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Aisha Thassan, lecturer and head of Department of Social Sciences of the Faculty of Arts and I will be the master of ceremony for today's session. Uh, this session is entitled as History of Japan's Educational Development Implications for Maldives. On behalf of JICA and MNU, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you to this lecture hosted by the Faculty of Arts of the Maldives National University. This seminar explores Japan's modernization and development cooperation experiences in light of its historical and cultural background. This lecture is planned as a commemora commemorative event to mark the 55th anniversary of Maldives and Japan. The session began with the recitation of Holy Quran by Al Falila Hairunisa Muhammad. Now I would like to take the opportunity to invite Ambassador of Japan to the Maldives, Her Excellency. Midori Takeuchi to provide the welcome re remarks. Her Excellency Midori Takeuchi.
Thank you. His Excellency, Mr. Hassan Sabil, Ambassador of Japan to the Maldives, uh, Ambassador of Maldives to Japan, who may be uh, um, joining online, and Dr. Mohammed Sharif, Vice Chancellor MNU, Dr. Adam Shahinaz Ali, Deputy Vice Chancellor MNU, and distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure and honor for me to deliver welcome remarks here at the MNU for this open seminar for JICA Chair Program as one of the events to celebrate the 55th anniversary of the establishment of the diplomatic relations between the Republic of Maldives and Japan. We have nurtured mutual trust and enjoyed long friendship over the years, which eventually led to the establishment of Maldive Embassy in Tokyo in 2007 and the Japanese Embassy in 2016. I believe this year is the opportune timing to strengthen our relations by learning from each other with academic point of view, looking back to such lessons from the past to create greater future together. For this purpose, we held the inductive seminar, induction seminar for JICA chair program on 28th February this year at here in MNU and which attracted a huge audience. Against this backdrop, I'm pleased to be here again to witness this opening seminar as the official launch of this program in collaboration with MNU. Today, Dr. Kuroda, Professor of Waseda University, will give a special lecture on the higher education system in Japan from international perspective. So I'm certain that his talking points will include and elaborate that now Japan provides great academic opportunities for students from all over the world to study, mingle, research, and engage with global challenges to, for the future. I truly look forward to listening to his enlightening opinion. Many people agree that human resource development is a key for development of a nation, a region, and the globe. In order to meet this request, JICA has provided wide range of short and long-term training programs on specific issues. So it is high time to elevate the relations between Maldives and Japan in the field of higher education. I'm pleased to re uh, re uh, report the initiation of the project for Human Resource Development Scholarship Program, or JDS. Under the Japan's grant aid scheme, six young Maldivian officials started to uh, the fully funded master's program in three leading Japanese universities in September 2021. And the second batch, another six government officials are following this month. And we will soon start recruitment process for the third year. So studying Japan is still rare among Maldivians, so there are more chances to be successful. According to the statistics of the Ministry of Education in Japan, the number of Maldivians studying in Japanese universities range from three to eight during the 2017 to 2021. In Australia, however, 
131 Maldivian students were studying in 2020, according to the UNESCO statistics. It is my sincere hope that more and more Maldivian people to study in Japan with the help of those who have successfully completed JDS program, spread the experience and kind word of suggestions. The continuation of this project will have a great ripple effect on both countries. But please allow me to introduce another project program that Ministry of Education in Japan has been providing full scholarship program for doctors, masters, and vocational school programs. And their office, Embassy of Japan, is conducting a recruitment process. So lastly, but not least, I'd like to convey my sincere appreciation to all the people who made this event possible. Thank you all for your participation today and enjoy. Shukriya. Thank you, Your Excellency Takeuchi. The next in the agenda is a speech by Mr. Taki Mato, resident representative of JICA Maldives, Mr. Taki Mato. His Excellency, Mr. Hassan Sobir, Ambassador of Maldives to Japan. Her Excellency, Ms. Takeuchi Midori, Ambassador of Japan to Maldives. Dr. Mohammad Sharif, Vice Chancellor, Maldives National University, MNU. Distinguished guests, honorable participants here and online, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is my great pleasure to have a few words for introduction of today's open seminar of JICA Chair Program. First of all, I'd like to introduce what is a JICA Chair Program. JICA Chair Program started in 2019 for the purpose of expanding opportunities to run Japanese studies in partner countries. Sorry which explores uh, Japan's modernization and uh, development experiences in light of historical and cultural background. By sharing Japanese experiences and also lessons learned through its unique historical and modernization experiences, uh, both in a good way and a bad way, we are expecting that the audiences of partner countries will be able to draw any implications that would be used for better and sustainable socioeconomic development. JICA chair program have been conducted so far at university more than 40 countries. As for motives, the, our ambassador kindly mentioned the induction seminar for JICA chair program was conducted in MNU at this auditorium this February. Based on this, we are very pleased to hold this opening seminar as a official launch of JICA Chair program in collaboration with MNU. Secondly, I'd like to introduce today's special lecturer, Dr. Kazu Kuroda. Dr. Kazu Kuroda is a professor and dean of Graduate School of Asian Pacific Studies, Waseda University. For your reference, Waseda University is founded, was founded in late 19th century and is one of the top university in Japan. Waseda University is also famous for nurturing the many policy makers. Okay, uh, it's okay. Nurturing many policy makers, and uh, so far, 
eight Japanese prime ministers graduated from Waseda University, including the current prime minister, Mr. Kishida. Dr. Kuroda is a very famous uh, Japanese scholar in the discipline of comparative education and also international education development. He serves for the UNESCO and uh, several advisory committee of Japanese government ministries and also a JICA Research Institute as well. He is an also editorial member of academic journal and publications of educational sector. He, uh, Dr. Kuroda, uh, Dr. Kuroda earned his bachelor degree from the Waseda University, the MA from Stanford University, and PhD from Cornell University. We are very, very pleased to be able to invite Dr. Kuroda here today in person from Japan. Thirdly, uh, I'd like to thank you for today a many online participants joining today's seminar. For the main presentation, after the main presentation of the Dr. Kuroda, Dr. Kuroda can receive the several questions uh, during the remaining period, remaining time period. If the online participant have any questions, uh, please use your uh, chat function in your PC. However, uh, due to time limitations, technical conditions, please allow us if the not all uh, questions can be attended. The finally, and not, last, not at least, uh, I'd like to expand a sincere appreciation to the people in MNU, particularly uh, Dr. Shehenas, Deputy Vice Chancellor of MNU, and also the staff of the Central Administration of the MNU for their dedicated support in realizing today's seminar. Thank you very much. Shukriya. Thank you, resident representative, Mr. Taki. Now I would kindly like to request our distinguished speaker, Dr. Kazuo Kuroda, Professor and Dean of Graduate School of Asia Pacific Studies of Waseda University to deliver a lecture on history of Japan's educational development implications for Maldives, Dr. Kazuo Kuroda. Hello. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for your kind introduction. Oh, sure. Thank you very much actually for your kind introductions and a very nice opening. Uh, just a moment. Okay, good, thank you. So uh, first of all, I'd like to extend my sincere gratitude for uh, Maldiv National University uh, and then also JICA and Japanese Embassy uh, for uh, inviting uh, me here. Uh, I'm very, very glad to be back to Maldiv because I uh, came here in 2010 and 2011, a uh, long time ago already, but uh, uh, to uh, study about the Maldivian education systems at that time. And then uh, with uh, as a kind of organization, organized uh, research project by the uh, Japan Comparative Education Society. And then so at that time I, I fell in love with this beautiful country, but I had ne I never had the uh, next opportunity to come back. But this time, uh, uh, thank you, actually you realized that. And, uh, I'm very glad to be here back. Okay, so so uh, today I'd like to talk about the Japanese education from the international perspectives uh, to draw the implications for uh, Maldives. Uh, especially, I'd like to highlight the internationalization of higher educations because I uh, to study about the current situations or uh, policy priority of the Maldives on education. Uh, I checked this uh, uh, Maldives education uh, sector plan, which was developed in uh, 2019 and uh, scoped uh, uh, until 2023. So it was certainly actually developed before the COVID-19. So I'm sure I think there's a certain adjustment, but uh, still uh, I'm very sure the core part of this policy is alive. Uh, and then uh, two uh, of the core principles of the uh, 
of this uh, model of education sector uh, plan is, I think, uh, is very much uh, related with the higher education, especially, I think, uh, this, the first part, I think that all students acquire knowledge, skills, and values uh, 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 require, uh, required for successful completion of the each stage of education, including uh, higher education for 21st century skills, uh, for a decent life in an interconnected world characterized by globalization and economic integration. Uh, and then also, uh, the provision of higher education and TVET enhances the capacity to contribute to uh, social well-being, uh, poverty reduction, and shared economic growth and uh, prosperity, while also responding to the needs of the 21st century economy. Uh, so to respond uh, to this uh, educational priority uh, uh, set actually in the, by the Maldivian policies, uh, I think the internationalization of higher education may be a one uh, possible strategy. So I'd like to uh, review uh, the, uh, this uh, uh, experience of the Japanese uh, education for the internationalizations. But uh, before that, uh, I'd like to confirm you know, what is the uh, internationalization of higher education. Uh, According to Knight, who is the, probably the most famous uh, uh, researcher on this field of the internationalization of higher education uh, at the uh, University of Toronto, uh, defined the internationalization of higher education as the integration of the international, intercultural, or global dimensions into the goals, functions, and uh, delivery of education as a means to prove or achieve academic objectives of the institutions or social, cultural, economic, or political goals of the country. Uh, so, and then also she defines the regionalization of higher education as the process of building closer collaboration and alignment among higher education actors and systems within the defined area of a framework called a region that I'm also going to uh, explain about the uh, uh, Japanese experience on the regionalization of higher education later. Uh, and then as you can see in the uh, framework, the internationalization of higher education is considered as a reactor uh, to the uh, globalizations. As uh, in your policy, also uh, you recognize that this ongoing socioeconomic globalizations and education policy is directed to react to the globalizations. So certainly internationalization of higher education is a reactor uh, to globalizations. And then, Internationalization activities. What are the international, actual internationalization of the higher education? Uh, we classify actually this uh, internationalization of higher education at, at, uh, into two folds: uh, at home internationalization and abroad uh, internationalization, abroad and cross-border internationalizations. And internationalization at home includes the internationalization of the curriculum, teaching, learning, uh, or uh, international joint promoting international joint research or international uh, inviting international students to your home institutions. Uh, and then, but at the same time, there is uh, also the internationalization collaborating with the partner uh, institutions abroad. Uh, that's actually the considered international cross-border internationalization. Particularly, that happens uh, with the uh, mobility of the people, uh, including, of course, students uh, and the faculty members. Uh, students studying abroad and then also faculty training abroad, uh, they are uh, considered the internationalization of higher education. And then also, not only the people, uh, these days actually there is a program international, uh, cross border uh, program internationalizations. Like uh, I'm sure actually in Maldives, actually you have uh, some Malaysian institutions uh, coming to Maldives to deliver some educations, uh, or Australian, uh, UK institutions also coming. That uh, can be considered as a provider's mobility or program mob mobility. Uh, actually, you know, in between, actually there is a, for example, joint degree, double degree programs uh, that's also arising in the world. Uh, can be considered as a mobility, uh, cross-border higher education. And then also uh, even the policies uh, uh, also uh, now actually being influenced by the global governance. So, so that also can be a cross-border internationalization. So why we are doing the uh, internationalization of higher education? There are many different actually kinds of the rationals uh, we can identify. Uh, for social, cultural, uh, uh, 
uh, rationals, uh, uh, international understanding, uh, growing uh, global citizenship, and uh, that kind of actually, of course, rationals can be, of course, I think maybe you can uh, uh, think about. However, interestingly enough, the national cultural identity in the political part, also we have a national uh, identity uh, promotions. Uh, there are many interesting actually academic evidences that the internationalization of higher education, student mobility can promote the national identity. Uh, so, so that's a, a, a interesting, I think, a part of the internationalizations, and then also uh, in the political sense. Of, so, of course, internationalization of higher education can be a foreign policy, uh, soft power policy, and then uh, also uh, as a uh, means to promote the peace and mutual understanding. Uh, and they also maybe actually promote the regional identity uh, as an Asian or as a South Asian or East Asian and so on. And then also uh, economic uh, rationales is very strong, of course, uh, for internationalization of higher education that promote economic growth and competitiveness and then uh, uh, and then also in the academic uh, aspects, uh, like uh, internationalization of higher education can promote the uh, uh, quality of education and then also uh, uh, enhance the research capabilities and then so on. So, so there are many different uh, multi-layered rationales for uh, internationalization of higher education. And then, so if we look at the, uh, the current trend uh, of the international uh, mobile students, uh, there is a steadily uh, in, uh, increase, uh, steady, a steady increase uh, of the international mobile students from 2011 uh, to 2017, and then, uh, and then, up to the COVID-19, of course, the COVID-19 had a very negative impact on the student mobility, as you know. Uh, and then, so that's actually it's kind of downfall uh, uh, in these years. But uh, I think in the, for this 2022, uh, there's a located, I think, in the back uh, of the uh, mobile, mobile uh, students. Uh, this is, can you see? I'm sorry, it's a bit uh, not good, clear, maybe. But uh, this is the, uh, by UNESCO, uh, growing number of the, uh, the statistics, uh, growing number of the, uh, the Maldivian students go abroad uh, can be confirmed. I think uh, for the last 20 years, I think you have uh, almost uh, seven times more, more uh, Maldivian students studying abroad, according to the UNESCO statistics. Uh, where they are going uh, from Maldives, uh, as Ambassador just actually mentioned, I think, you know, uh, the, of course, the Australia uh, is a big uh, uh, receiver of the Maldivian students, but the largest, actually, res uh, recipient of the uh, uh, host for Maldivian students is the Malaysia. Now, actually, more than half of the total 3,000 Maldivian students are going abroad, I think, uh, in going to uh, Malaysia, and then, uh, followed by the Sri Lanka, UK, uh, India, Australia, and Saudi Arabia. And interesting enough, actually later, uh, Belarus, U Ukraine, Russia, that's uh, interesting actually, the countries actually for the accepting the Maldivian students. And then I'm really, and as Ambassador actually mentioned, I think Japan, uh, in this year, only five uh, students actually came to uh, Maldives. And I really want to persuade <laughs> you uh, to come to uh, Japan. Uh, uh, but so, so then I think I'd like to, I think from here, uh, uh, to explain uh, about the, uh, our experience of the internationalization of higher education uh, in Japan. Uh, uh, and then uh, this is the statistics of the uh, international student enrollment in Japan. Uh, it means actually we, how many students uh, we uh, receive uh, from other countries. Uh, and then as you can see, actually in 2019, uh, that's the, just before the COVID, actually, we have achieved uh, these 300,000 uh, international uh, students. Actually, this is actually originally target, actually, for Japanese government to have these 300,000 international students. It, it was achieved uh, in the, uh, almost achieved, I think, in 2019. Uh, and then, uh, uh, so, so there's a big, actually, I think, you know, historically, uh, growing number of the international students coming to Japan. 
as uh, where are they going? Uh, they are going to the graduate school level, university level, and then professional technical college levels. And then also recently, uh, there are many students actually in the Japanese language institutions. So in this way, I think in the uh, uh, different actually layers, uh, we are receiving the international students. And then no, I have to note that I think uh, many of them are studying in English. You may have a kind of uh, stereotype about the Japanese higher education, uh, which is provided historically in the Japanese language. Uh, however, uh, in the recent uh, internationalization uh, effort of the Japanese government and the universities, uh, we have, operate, uh, have been uh, operating actually a uh, uh, good number of the English operated programs. Uh, so, uh, for example, at Waseda University, uh, oh, yeah, that's right, actually, maybe that's, that's the thing. In the Waseda University, actually, I'm sorry, this slide is only for showing off my university because uh, our university, Waseda, is the largest host university for international uh, students among. Uh, uh, among all Japanese universities. Uh, and then many of the top universities in Japan are included here. Uh, so, so in the list of the league table of the, how many uh, international students studying at uh, in Japan. But uh, at the uh, Waseda, actually in this year, in 1990, actually this year I remember uh, more than 8,000 actually international students studying at Waseda, half of them are uh, studying in the international uh, English operated programs. Uh, so, so, uh, so, so you can complete your education programs uh, in English. Uh, how, where are they from? I mean, from uh, in general, I think in Japan, uh, uh, from uh, the country. China is a big host uh, sender of, the, of course, the Japanese uh, international students. Actually, to many of the uh, host countries of the international students, China probably uh, represents the largest uh, number, maybe. But the, uh, for especially, actually, for Japan, we have a historical relations in education uh, between the China and Japan. Uh, they send, uh, sorry, uh, they send a lot. Uh, of the uh, international student to Japan, but followed by Vietnam, Nepal, uh, the third uh, l largest uh, international student's body are uh, coming from Nepal, and then uh, South Korea, Taiwan, Indonesia, Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka also sends uh, so many uh, international students to Japan, and then uh, Myanmar, uh, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, and the United States. So most of the international students uh, uh, who are studying in Japan are from Asia, and then also some good number of the South Asian uh, international students also coming to uh, Japan. Okay, and then, so this is the uh, uh, trends of the number of the international Japanese students uh, uh, studying abroad. Uh, and then, so it is actually, there's a steady uh, increase. If we include the uh, short-term programs, actually there's a strong uh, concerns of the, about the Japanese government uh, sometime early 2000s uh, about the uh, uh, kind of losing interest of the Japanese young people to go abroad to study. And then, because we have historically really sent so many international uh, Japanese students to abroad, uh, historically, uh, that I explained uh, on Thursday uh, 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 lecture. But uh, uh, somehow, actually, now the, the Japanese students, uh, young people, actually, uh, uh, you know, sometimes actually uh, uh, seem to be lost, actually, their, to have lost uh, their interest in studying abroad. So the Japanese government really uh, try to enhance and promote uh, the student mobility to outside, uh, outbound mobility. And then including, if we include the short-term programs, the number uh, is now actually in increasing. Uh, in this way. Of course, that also was very negatively affected by the COVID. So for excluding actually the year of the 2020 and 2021. So uh, where they are going, uh, the Japanese students are going to uh, study abroad. The first four destinations, uh, the, the most popular destinations for Japanese students to study uh, is, uh, is uh, English, uh, English uh, Frank, uh, uh, Anglophone countries. Uh, and then, but, but, you know, number five, South, uh, South Korea, number six, China, and number nine, Thailand, and number 10, Taiwan. So there are some Asian countries also uh, becoming a larger middle uh, host uh, for the Japanese uh, students. Uh, you know, equivalent with the Germany and France, actually, which was the old uh, 
not told, but uh, you know, kind of uh, destination for the Japanese students abroad. So how the Japanese uh, uh, government is trying, uh, uh, is trying to internationalize the Japanese uh, uh, higher education by the policies, uh, initiatives. Uh, this in 2008, for example, uh, as I just actually mentioned, uh, 300,000 uh, international student uh, plan target was set. Uh, before that, actually in the early 80s, we had 100,000 international students target. Uh, uh, and then uh, at the time in the early 1980s, actually uh, only actually probably 10,000 students, international students were studying in Japan. And then uh, that time in the Prime Minister uh, Nakasone uh, had a great vision actually to increase 10 times more international students. And then it was achieved early uh, 21st century. Uh, early 2000s. Uh, and then that's why uh, another Prime Minister, Prime Minister Fukuda, uh, launched this new initiative of the, to increase the 300,000 international students' target. Uh, and it was achieved in 2020. Uh, and then uh, also 2009, uh, there's a Global 30. Uh, they select, started to select the top universities in Japan for the internationalizations uh, and then finance more uh, to these uh, universities to uh, make them to have more English programs. Uh, so that really uh, increased the uh, number of the English operated programs in Japan that uh, uh, attracted uh, different kinds of the international students uh, compared to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the old days. And then uh, also uh, 2011, entire university exchange uh, project was started that I'm going to explain uh, in a minute. And then also 2012, the Go Global uh, Japan project also was uh, launched. That's also again the, about the inter inviting the international uh, students. Uh, and then 2014, the top global uh, university project that I'm going to explain also, and the Tobitate Study Abroad Initiative, uh, I, I, I mean, uh, this actually to promote the Japanese students to study abroad. So inbound and outbound uh, mobility of the students are very quite a big focus actually for the internationalization of higher education at that time. Uh, this is an inter-university exchange project. That is a very interesting, uh, unique project, uh, which was started in 2011 with the Campus Asia, which is actually with the China and Korea, and then also the United States at the time, and then uh, later uh, ASEAN uh, or Europe or Russia, India, you know, different regions, Latin America. The different regions are targeted to have the, uh, to make a link uh, between the uh, particular region uh, and uh, the, the South, uh, sorry, the Japanese higher education. Uh, so, so uh, this year, actually, we just actually uh, finished the selections of the Indo-Pacific uh, corporations uh, of higher education uh, uh, inter-university exchange project. Top uh, global uh, university project is actually the selecting the two types of the universities. One is the top type, the research-oriented university, 13 of them, uh, including my own university and the University of Tokyo and Kyoto University, that the uh, uh, top type project, and then it's also global uh, traction uh, type. Uh, for the more focusing on the globalization and internationalization uh, type of the universities. And then uh, in this way, uh, we are uh, targeting to, of the internationalized, supporting uh, internationalization, the particular uh, type of the uh, universities and the good universities, because we have uh, more than 800 uh, universities in Japan. And uh, we are only targeting 37 uh, universities for uh, some financing for internationalization of higher education, not to make the kind of internationalization of higher education uh, to help the lower rank uh, private universities to survive and then to attract the international students and to fill out. Uh, no, no, uh, government is trying to uh, have a different, actually, uh, possible, a different uh, 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 policy initiative actually to support the top universities uh, to have a to provide the quality international education for the uh, international and Japanese students. 
So, so key elements of the Japanese international higher education policies are, are is to strengthen internationalization of higher education through accepting more international students, sending and sending more Japanese uh, students abroad, and the introductions of uh, uh, English operative programs, uh, and also promotion of the international collaborative uh, education programs. Uh, like a joint degree, double degree, uh, or some educational collaborations is so much enhanced uh, with the, our partner institutions. And then also to promote the world-class university, not the uh, uh, kind of popular university, but the world-class institutions uh, for globalizations, setting up the global COE, the center of excellence, uh, and then also top global university initiatives. Uh, and then also, uh, uh, to contribute to the global society to the achieve uh, SDGs. That's also the terminal goal of the internationalization policies of uh, Japanese higher education. Uh, open Japanese higher education for opening the Japanese higher education for global society. We try to promote the global citizenship ESD and then culture of peace, uh, that's actually uh, very importantly defined in the SDGs, and then also uh, promote uh, joint research, uh, international joint research to contribute to the achievement of the SDGs, uh, or to uh, find the solutions uh, for the, this global uh, development goals. So from now, I I'd like to also explain about uh, Japan and the uh, regionalizations, and then from the perspectives of the internationalization of higher education. Uh, uh, because this is also another very important experience of the internationalization of higher education of our country. Uh, uh, this is a historical development of the multi-layered structure of the Asian uh, regional cooperation frameworks. Uh, in uh, Southeast Asia, ASEAN was born uh, in 1967, and then in your region in South Asia, the SARC was born uh, in 1985. ASEAN, by the way, actually became the ASEAN community in 2015, so actually it was a more strengthened uh, community was built. Uh, and then APEC, I'm not sure if you have heard, uh, APEC is the Asia Pacific Economic Corporation, uh, started in uh, 1989, and then ASEAN plus three meetings, three is uh, Korea, Japan, uh, Korea, China, and Japan, uh, uh, started to invite to have a meeting with ASEAN uh, in uh, 1997, and then East Asian Summit uh, started. Uh, by the ASEAN uh, plus seven countries, uh, including China, Korea, Japan, the plus three countries with Australia, New Zealand, and India. Very interesting, right? The East Asian Summit and invite the Australia, New Zealand, and, and India, uh, uh, very typical uh, South Asian country. But uh, anyway, uh, that's actually that happened. And now actually they have, that this framework has a somehow Russia and the United States, but anyway. Uh, and the CKJ, the Korea, uh, the China, Korea, Japan, a trilateral summit also started in 2008. Uh, uh, still ongoing, but uh, it's actually stacked uh, because of the, the diplomatic relations between the China and Japan and Korea, Japan, and, and, and so on. But uh, uh, still, I think it's ongoing. Uh, and then uh, China started the uh, Belt and Road Initiative uh, uh, in uh, nine, uh, 2013, and then Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, TPP, launched in the 2018, uh, based on the Asia-Pacific Corporations, and then uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic uh, Partnership, launched in 2020. That's actually based on the ASEAN Plus Three, or no, uh, six uh, frameworks. Uh, and then end uh, in the Pacific Economic uh, Framework, IPEF uh, launched just this year. So in this way, there is a multi-layered uh, regional structures are forming in this region of Asia. You know, this is, each of them are different framework, but they uh, very multi-layered. I think I think it uh, should be more interconnected than by the frameworks. But anyway, the, I think the background of the this policy discussion on the Asian regional uh, corporations is the growing relative presence of Asia in the world economy, uh, and then increasing economic interdependence uh, within uh, the regions. And then that formulates a relatively self-sustaining economic structure less dependent on the West, uh, and then Asianization of Asia, the economy 
economists actually call it, the Asianization of Asia, uh, witnessed in the economies of the regions. Uh, and then uh, that presents a certain necessity for Asian regional governance framework, and then that is a kind of background of the uh, policy discussion on the Asian regional uh, corporations. So let's look at that uh, higher education, because I talked about the political and economic integrations, and then uh, but the status of the higher education. For example, inbound uh, mobile students. This is the, the largest host in uh, countries, uh, historically, traditional largest host countries for international students, uh, which are US, France, and UK. Uh, and then uh, they, from the last 20 years and two decades, from the 1998 to 2018, uh, the number of the international students in, uh, studying in these three countries uh, became all, uh, more than doubled, 2.56 uh, times. However, if you look at the China, Korea, Japan, uh, of course, the base number in 1998 was smaller, that's why, but the, the number of the, grow, uh, the, the uh, multitude uh, of the growth of the international students' number is very great uh, for China and Korea. And even uh, Japan exceeded the Western countries' average, the 3.28 uh, 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 times. So, so we have a, a really uh, more and more uh, uh, fast growth of the uh, international students uh, in the Asian countries, in the East Asian countries. So, so according to the UNESCO statistics in 2021, the out of the total uh, 1 million five hundred thousand international students uh, uh, from East Asia and the Pacific, uh, 800,000, 880,000 uh, went to East Asia and the, and the Pacific, and then uh, 560,000 uh, uh, went to North America and 340,000 went to Europe. So it's a case of stereotype maybe, right? Because we thought actually the international study abroad is to go to the Western countries, but uh, for the, uh, the students in the uh, East Asia and, and uh, Pacific, actually now already its own region became the big host uh, regions for the international uh, mobility. Uh, and then not only the international students' mobility, but also the program mobility or joint uh, degree and double degree. It's a bit uh, old, actually, statistics, I'm sorry, but uh, I conducted uh, these surveys for the, uh, the leading uh, institutions, uh, higher education institutions in Southeast Asia and the Northeast Asia uh, with the uh, JICA Research Institute in 2010. And then that time, we found that uh, uh, now already the East Asia became the largest uh, collaborator for the joint degree, double degree, that kind of collaborative degree programs uh, for East Asian uh, higher education institutions. Uh, uh, historically, of course, Western Europe was a big, actually, uh, uh, partner for the Southeast Asian, especially, actually, the uh, higher education institutions. But uh, now its own regions of the East Asia became the bigger. Uh, and then this is actually for the Japanese universities, uh, the partnership about the inter-university partnership or linkages, uh, uh, sorry, some in Japanese, but uh, uh, in 1981, uh, the North America was the most popular uh, partner regions for Japanese universities to have the partnership with uh, and followed by Europe and then Asia and Oceania. But now it's definitely Asia. Asia is the largest uh, and the most popular uh, partner uh, regions for Japanese uh, universities to have the uh, inter-university linkages with, uh, followed by Europe and North America. Uh, this is the uh, uh, more recent statistics by the country uh, for the Japanese universities, uh, collaborations. In 2020, uh, China is the largest uh, uh, interesting, I think, because for the last 20 years, we have a very not good uh, diplomatic relations between the China and Japan, but the, the number of the uh, inter-university uh, partnerships almost doubled uh, during the time, and then of course, uh, that's actually uh, also includes with the United States, but uh, also with South Korea, uh, Taiwan, and then oh, oh, fifth rank uh, was uh, replaced, by, you know, used to be UK, but uh, now Thailand. Uh, for Japanese universities. Uh, 
uh, this is a uh, uh, inter-university linkages, uh, oh, sorry, branch offices abroad. The Japanese universities to have the branches uh, offices abroad uh, is a kind of trend. And then uh, we see uh, many uh, uh, located in Asia. Uh, uh, in the country, more recent actual statistics, that China uh, hosts 150 university, Japanese universities uh, branch offices, followed by Thailand, Vietnam, USA, and Indonesia. Uh, this is also another uh, survey's uh, result of the, that I conducted with the JICA Research Institute. Uh, as you can see, uh, for South Asian, uh, Southeast Asian uh, uh, leading higher education institutions, the South, its own region of the Southeast Asia is the most active cross-border uh, partner uh, region, Southeast Asia, followed by uh, South, North uh, East Asia, then Western Europe, North America, uh, Oceania, and then the South and West uh, Asia. Uh, so, so this is the visions, uh, perspectives of uh, the Southeast Asian uh, leading universities. For the Northeast Asian, uh, leading universities of China, uh, Korea, Japan. Uh, it's a bit different, but uh, almost equally, the North America, Southeast Asia, uh, Northeast Asia, and Western Europe are regarded as active uh, partner regions, followed by the Oceanian, Pacific, and South and West Asia. Uh, so this is, uh, so, so, so uh, summing up, the, the Growing, the, I think, the fact of the internationalization of, or, or international higher education in uh, Asia is the growing presence of Asian countries as the hosts of the international students, uh, and then growing number of the students started to move from Asia to Asia, uh, and then possible growing number of the inter-university partnership and the international uh, collaborative degree programs within Asia, uh, and then uh, Asian universities' perspectives uh, perceive uh, Asia as the most active partner regions uh, for the internationalizations. And then Asianization of Asia is uh, also confirmed the international higher education, uh, uh, not only in the field of economy. And then, so that's actually uh, presents such a necessity to discuss the Asian regional uh, governance framework uh, from the perspective of the international uh, higher education. So there are several initiatives actually launched by not only, uh, but uh, I think I'd like to introduce some of the Japanese initiatives uh, because this is the experience of the Japanese uh, 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 educations. And then, uh, for example, Prime Minister Fukuda uh, in 2008 uh, started to talk about this Asian version of Elasmus. Have you ever heard the Elasmus? Elasmus is the, uh, Oh, in, now actually it's expanded to the other regions, but in Europe, there's in 1980s actually, they started to have a, uh, the mechanism of the intra-regional, intra-regional uh, student faculty mobility uh, programs as Erasmus programs. And then, uh, so Prime Minister Fukuda, who launched the 300,000 international target, uh, student target, also actually uh, proposed this Erasmus uh, program by the, in the Asian versions. Uh, later, uh, Prime Minister Fukuda and then uh, at the uh, CKJ summit uh, uh, proposed the, the another uh, three countries, the China, Korea, Japan, uh, collaborative frameworks of uh, higher education. That's actually later became uh, called the Campus Asia. That's uh, uh, now still ongoing. Uh, or in spite of the diplomatic relations, still actually, once it is established, uh, education programs can independently go on. So we can, we are still actually having this Campus Asia framework. Uh, and then also Prime Minister Abe, uh, when he became the Prime Minister, uh, uh, just became actually at that time, I think in 2013, uh, he attended this 16th ASEAN Plus 3 summit and then uh, uh, tried to address actually the importance of the people to people con connectivity uh, uh, in the field of education tourism uh, in the APT uh, ASEAN Plus 3 frameworks. Uh, also, in 2015, actually, to attend attending the, this UN SDG summit, uh, 
Prime Minister uh, Abe uh, also, again, actually uh, launched uh, this learning strategy for peace and growth, uh, achieving quality education through mutual learning. That's uh, uh, our ongoing, actually, educational uh, cooperation strategy and then policy documents. Uh, and then uh, in that, uh, 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 they uh, emphasize that uh, in Asian regions, Japan will contribute to the regional higher education corporations. Uh, so in this way, Japan has had, and JICA also actually follow up uh, these trends, uh, try to uh, help uh, the regional uh, corporations of higher education in Asia. So um, this, <laughs> so many actually, I, I can't actually explain everything, but uh, uh, there's a recent uh, trends of the regionalization of higher education started with the uh, ASEM uh, Plus 3 higher education policy dialogue and then uh, SAAC ministers of education, higher education uh, meeting also was started in 2009. Uh, and then uh, Shimeo, Shimeo is the, the Southeast Asian ministers of education organizations actually under the ASEAN uh, that also uh, started the uh, interesting actual program, the MIT and, and uh, ASEAN International Mobility for Students AIMS program, and then this is ASEAN, uh, but the, uh, Japan joined and Korea joined. Now actually this, this became ASEAN plus two uh, framework, and then uh, South Asia University was established uh, in India. Uh, that's actually under the SAC uh, initiatives. And then uh, uh, Campus Asia, I just, I just uh, explained about the trilateral uh, collaboration also started. And then also Asia Pacific Regional Convention on the uh, recognition of the qualifications of higher education was adopted in 2011 uh, uh, as an initiative of UNESCO. And then ASEAN plus three university networks formulated ASEAN plus three uh, working group on the mobility of higher education and quality assurance, uh, etc., and then also with the uh, Belt and Road Initiatives, China uh, formed this Asian University Alliance and the University Consortium 21st Century Maritime Silk Road uh, was established. So, so again, actually, there are so uh, multi-layered uh, collaborative framework of higher education was constructed. There are different. Uh, frameworks and with a different uh, definition of the regions, but a very multi-layered way uh, they are uh, being formed in Asia. Uh, even the quality assurance framework, I think it is a, a, a very important initiative of the uh, uh, regional quality assurance framework. So why do we have uh, this kind of the Asian collaborative framework of higher education? Uh, one is the kind of peace and political approach, I think. Uh, there are, uh, uh, there is uh, one document I think we can find, I think in the uh, Colombo declarations uh, at the uh, first uh, East Asian summit, actually they said developing a we feeling through greater interactions between students, academicians, researchers, to fight intolerance and improve understanding among cultures and civilizations. Certainly, internationalization of higher education as well as this regionalization of higher education uh, is aimed at the peace and um, uh, political stability, I think, of the, uh, among the different countries. Uh, that's around, of course, political dimensions. But at the same time, there's a, a economic dimensions of the internationalization of higher education. Uh, this is the uh, 20s. Uh, APEC economic leaders uh, declarations uh, on the promotions of the cross-border education corporations. Uh, they said that uh, facilitating the flow of the students, researchers, and education providers uh, can promote uh, economic development through knowledge and skills transfer. Uh, high sc uh, quality uh, cross-border uh, education equips students with the 21st century competencies that was sought by the uh, Maldivian education plans also, and they need for their their full participation in the globalized and the knowledge-based uh, society. Uh, so, so this is the political statements actually that uh, seconded the regionalizations of higher education uh, in Asia. 
Theoretically, I actually, of course, because I'm a scholar, also I'd like to uh, look at uh, uh, this Asian regionalization of higher education from a theoretical way. But uh, uh, for example, I, I see actually Asian regional higher education uh, uh, collaborations as a kind of uh, uh, mosaic type cooperation rather than a melting pot type of cooperations because the European higher education uh, collaborations in EU and then also Bologna process, as you may know, uh, uh, they are trying to create the uh, one system uh, as a melting pot. But uh, in Asia, we can't do it because we have a very big diversity of higher education. And the diversity is the good things, of course, uh, in Asia. So that's why uh, we can't actually make uh, one melting pot to cooperate and to uh, integrate all the higher education systems in Asia. But uh, we can uh, make a connectivity uh, and to embrace the diversity of the higher education. That's the directions of the uh, Asian higher education regionalizations, I think. One time in the theoretical, actually in, the in our field of comparative international education, there was an eminent scholar called Altbach, Philip Altbach, uh, who actually uh, uh, illustrated the Asian higher education as a periphery in the core periphery uh, relations in the world. In the international knowledge systems, it's so much dominated by the Western core and then uh, Asian higher education in the periphery. And then, however, in the ongoing, actually, this very rapid growth of the higher education uh, in Asia, I'm so much impressed by the Maldivian higher education, uh, and, you know, and then use actually the growth uh, for the last ten, uh, 10 years. Uh, you know, the same as in other countries also in the 21st century, we see so great growth of the higher education systems in Asia. And then we can't really see the uh, education, you know, the high, Asian higher education as a periphery in the uh, dependency uh, structures. However, using actually these frameworks, maybe uh, we can say that the regionalization of higher education is a kind of the reactor the, or counterforce to the uh, Western dominations of the uh, higher uh, education or international knowledge systems. Uh, and then also there's a, uh, uh, the flying geese model that I want to explain. I mean, have you ever heard the flying geese model? That is the explanations of how the East Asian uh, economy uh, became uh, the, the achieved the fast uh, economic growth. Uh, that's actually like a flying geese, uh, you know, because they, they go together uh, and then uh, grow together. Uh, that's actually the, what uh, East Asian achieved in the flying, as a flying geese to, to do the uh, fast, economic, fast uh, eco development. And I think the higher education in the field also, I, I would uh, be able, I think I apply the, the same logics I of the higher education. Higher education institutions in Asia can develop together. Uh, or systems can develop together as a flying geese, uh, and then that's uh, one uh, directions of the regionalization of higher education. So, okay, uh, okay, and how, uh, so now actually I'd like to actually, in the end, ending actually this presentation, I'd like to uh, see the post-COVID, uh, post-corona uh, world uh, higher education transformations. First, uh, first, I think, of course, as you already, of course, recognize the use of ICT, uh, the international higher education, uh, will be drastically expanded. As I'm sure, actually, you have already experienced uh, this usage of the Zoom, uh, Zoom or you know, some other uh, online devices, actually, to deliver lectures. And then uh, already faculty members and students all are accustomed to uh, to the, these digital transformations. So we uh, have achieved certain capabilities. So that's actually, it's not only for the emergency of the coronavirus. I think in the future, it's going to be uh, used, uh, especially for the international higher education. So online delivery degree programs, mixture of the online and face-to-face -face programs, and then innovative forms of the international uh, education programs with online education will be emerged. Uh, and then Asian higher education regional cooperation will be also transformed and expanded significantly by this DX uh, digital transformation trends. Uh, and then also, 
uh, it's a, a bit political maybe, but in the long term that China, US uh, diplomatic relations, because the China is the largest sender of the international students and US is the largest host uh, for the international students. And then may affect uh, on the general state of the international higher education and patterns of the student mobility. However, we need to protect and promote the multi-layered structure of the regional and the institutional international partnerships of higher education so that we can incorporate uh, the uh, diversity and dynamism uh, with our higher education systems, reforming uh, the importance and the meanings of the international higher education partnerships uh, and the student mobility for peace and uh, socio-economic development of the region and the world. Uh, and then an ongoing development of the Indo-Pacific cooperation uh, uh, may be an opportunity for South Asian higher education to be more linked with the East Asian higher education framework. I think, uh, as I already showed you, actually this um, uh, survey results, South and West Asia, this is actually the surveys for the South, uh, sorry, the East Asian institutions, and then they regard that uh, Southeast Asia is a uh, possible uh, partners, already actually the partners for the internationalization of higher education for both uh, Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia. Uh, so I think in the future, I really actually want to propose the uh, uh, South Asian higher education framework uh, will be uh, linked with the East Asian uh, framework. And then in the end, uh, the, with the socioeconomic globalization, many issues started to cross national borders, and then it has become impossible for a single nation to fully recognize these cross-border issues and solutions and seek appropriate directions by uh, implementing their policies alone. So global and regional uh, governance framework are uh, being formulated. And then, so the SDGs is uh, one of them, I think, and it's very important uh, one of them, I think. And then COVID-19, they affirmed the trend and then uh, necessity of the global and regional governance and the international corporations. Uh, so that's why I see uh, international higher education should effectively tackle global issues such as the infection of diseases and then uh, global warming and other listed in the uh, SDGs. That's the, uh, should be the target uh, of the uh, internationalization of higher education as the experience of the Japanese education. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, sorry, one more very important actually uh, information I shall I need to provide uh, you with. Uh, this is actually, if you are in, I really hope that more and more DBM uh, students come to Japan uh, to study. And then uh, if you're interested in studying in Japan, uh, the, there are several sites about the Japanese uh, for the uh, 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 foreign students actually who are interested in uh, Japanese education. But especially, uh, Ambassador already mentioned, Takisan uh, from the uh, JICA already mentioned this, uh, Japanese Embassy Max Carsips and then also uh, JICA JDS Carsips are now open. So. Please do apply actually for these scholarships. And then also, uh, if you're interested, please come to uh, Japanese uh, higher education institutions. And Waseda, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kurodo. I'm sure there are a number of several, a number of important lessons that can be drawn for Maldives, especially in relation to interna inter internationalization of education in Japan. The next in the agenda is a closing, is the closing remarks by uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Arts, Mr. Asim Abdul Sattar. I would now kindly call upon uh, Mr. Asim Abdul Sattar to deliver the closing remarks. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Ambassador of Maldives to Japan. His Excellency Stas and Sobir, Ambassador of Japan to the Maldives, High Excellency Midori Takeuchi, Vice Chancellor Dr. Muhammad Sharif, Deputy Vice Chancellors Dr. Kuroda, 
Mr. Motu, heads, deans of faculties and centers, MNU staff, invited guests who are joining physically and virtually, Salaam Alaikum and a very good afternoon. First and foremost, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to the Ambassador of Japan to the Maldives, High Excellency uh, Midori Takeuchi, and the resident res representative and the guest speaker, Dr. Kuroda, for their valuable contribution to this JICA chair program at MNU. And I convey my sincere gratitude to all those who have attended this session and those who have helped to make this a successful event. Although I am assigned to give closing remarks, I want to highlight that the interactions between Japan and the Maldives can be tracked back for a long time. I note that since the establishment of diplomatic relations between the Maldives and Japan on 14th November 1967, Japan has been a significant partner in the socio-economic development of the Maldives. Since then, the two countries have been working closely in the international arena on important international issues such as peace and security, climate change, human security, and in the promote, promotion and protection of human rights through the world. As I recall, over the past decades, Japan has extended support to the Maldives in developing the fishery sector, expanding formal education, especially in the atolls, by building a school in each atoll, modernizing, modernizing the information communication technology infrastructure, enhancing disaster resili resilience, mitigation against climate change, and empowering the youth. It is not wrong to say that it has been such initiatives that, the, that contributed to the economic development of Maldives and led to the graduation of the, our country from least developed country status in 2011. Since the mid 90s, Japan has been one of the leading bilateral development partners of the Maldives from human resource development, environmental protection, sustainable fisheries, communications, and humanitarian and reconstruction assistance in the aftermath of Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004, Japanese assistance trans to all corners of the Maldivian archipelago. I remain confident that the strong ties of the friendship between the two countries will be strengthened in the years to come and look forward for more opportunities for further enhancing cooperation between the two countries. I am confident that the JICA chair program will forge greater cooperation between MNU and Japan. I wish for continued peace, progress, and prosperity for the friendly people of Japan. Before ending my closing remarks, I would like to convey a special thanks to Dr. Kuroda for his valuable speeches today and on Thursday. Highlights of these lectures reveal the Japanese experience in the development of school education and higher education and its implications that can be drawn for the Maldives. Finally, I extend my deepest gratitude to MNU management, especially marketing team for their valuable contributions and for organizing this event. Thank you all, have a good day.